Amen. Thank you. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Let me tell you a little bit of preparation here before we begin. Uh, I wanted to let you know what I, what I do to, stud, to do my studies. Very rarely do I tell you this. But on Mondays, usually on Mondays, things are rolling in my head. and I'm, I've already I've read through the Bible many, many times. And so I know where it's coming up. And so I've read it. And sometimes we read the Bible. And as we go through the Bible, uh, we don't catch everything that's there, obviously. It's one of the reasons why you're coming to an intense, in-depth Bible study. And so I always wondered about some of the things that I read in Acts chapter 9 because it seems to switch from Paul to Peter. Paul becomes, it's going from Peter to Paul, then Paul stops, as we say, I'll share that with you and give you a little review, and then Peter takes over for a little while, and then Paul comes back. And I always wonder with the construct of that. I always wonder why Dr. Luke did that in writing it, and man, it just opened up to me this week. I will spend usually about six hours on each study that I do, and as I spend those hours, a lot of that hour is just re reading through Scripture. It's making connections. It's not looking through any type of any type of books of other teachings. I don't do that. I just take it for what God wants to show me. And he has been so faithful to show me things. And tonight is no different. Tonight I'm going to give you a scenario. I'm probably going to read you a little bit of what I've written down because I couldn't write it fast enough. Because something was happening in Acts chapter 9 uh, with Peter that uh, we really need to see and see the whole, whole, uh, whole story about. So as we begin tonight, let me do a very quick review for you and preview of our outline and what we're doing. We know that uh, we've already, the uh, Jewish mission, the first phase, the birth of the church, Acts chapter 1 to, uh, 1 to 26, 40 days, the day of Pentecost, Peter's sermon, the first Christian church, miracles and preaching. Then we see from Acts chapter 6 to 931, appointment of the seven deacons, Stephen's defense and martyrdom. We see Philip and the Samaritans, Philip and the Ethiopian official, and the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. So we've been there. We've, this is where we've gone so far. We also know that we have seen the switch going on. We've seen that uh, it's all based on going to the Jews first, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. So that's the, that's the main thrust of what's happening in Acts. It's a pushing out of the church. So we know that Peter was instrumental in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And then we know that Paul will take it to the rest of the world. We're not there yet, but Paul will take it to the rest of the world. We also know some similarities between Paul and Peter. Jerusalem in part 1, chapters 1 to 12, Jerusalem was the center. Peter's the main character. Gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And Peter is then in prison. In part 2, chapters 13 to 28, uh, Antioch is the center. Paul is the main character. And the gospel goes to the other parts of the world and to Rome. And Paul is in prison. So we see a lot of things that are going on. Another outline of Acts tells us this. Acts 1, Jesus prepares the apostles. Acts 2 to 12, the ministry of Peter. Acts 13 to 28, the ministry of Paul. And in Acts 9 to a critical verse, Christianity is a way, a way of life. It's not a religion. You are not part of a religion. I want you to know that. You are part of a way of life. This is not something we put on on Sundays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. This is something that permeates us or should every single moment of our life. This is what changed the world and it's what will continue to change the world as we act as the saved and the filled and the ones that are gathered together in Christ's name. Come on, somebody say amen. So, so far in chapter 9, we have read, read about Saul blinded on the road to Damascus. We gave you great detail in what happened there. Then we talked about how he was blinded and used to lead people. Now he's being led to Damascus uh, totally blind. He's blind for three days. He's taken to a a wandering Ananias. Ananias is the leader of the Damascus church. He's the one that Saul is going to try to kill. He's the one that he's going to put in bonds. But Ananias is given a vision. Paul's given a vision. And basically they're instructed to go to each other. And we see this. We see that. Uh, imagine what must have been going on. This is just a review. In the mind of Ananias. Not only was Saul the persecutor now a believer in Jesus. But he was also Paul. God's chosen apostle. God tells him that. To take the gospel to the Gentile world. Can you imagine God giving you a dream and telling you, let's imagine that Osama bin Laden was alive and telling you that he has met Osama bin Laden and he has converted him and is sending him to the rest of the world, uh, the rest of the Arab world to preach Christianity and that uh, he's coming to kill you because you're a Christian. He has you in jail, but you, I want you to greet him and say it's okay. This is the equivalent of what's happening here. The equivalent is God's taking the arch enemy of Christianity and he's putting it right in front of someone and saying, I want you to accept him because I've chosen him. He's done nothing yet. He's not preached one good word. He's not said anything about Jesus. But God's telling Ananias in the dream, accept him because I'm sending him to the rest of the world. Pretty dramatic. So Ananias lays his hands on him. We know that uh, the scales fall off of Paul, uh, Saul's eyes. And Saul immediately, the Bible says, and he uses that word, he immediately starts to preach the gospel. And he preaches Jesus in Damascus synagogues. Now let me remind you what's in a synagogue there. 
Jews, non-believers. There may be Christians also. There were no Christian churches at this time. The Christians went to the Jewish synagogue because they were Jews, full Jews, ceremonial Jews, yet they believed in Christ as the Son of God. It was a big controversy in the church. And so it was almost causing a major split, as it would in any family that's Jewish that someone accepts Christ in. You're going to have some opposition. Listen, I had opposition just becoming a Protestant. I was born a Roman Catholic. Everybody in my family would live, live uh, born, lived, and died Roman Catholic. Catholics. I was an altar boy. When I told my mother I had, I had given my heart to Christ and I was, now, I was now a Protestant, she almost had five fits. And listen, she went nuts. She went crazy. People came over from our house from all my, all my relatives trying to convince me that I was going to Holy Roller Church. I was going to hell. I, le I, I left the true religion. Let, let me tell you something. Families don't take well to someone who changes their religion. Let me say amen. And you should know that. Uh, it's opposition. That's what Jesus said. Uh, the, your mother will oppose you. Your father, you, unless you love me more than your mother, more than your brother, more than your father. That's the key of Christianity. So, so what's happening here is that uh, Paul's going to the synagogue and he's preaching Jesus. And he's preaching, the Bible says, as we've studied, that he is the son of God. That's powerful. He doesn't know anything else. He's, does not, he's, not, he's not steeped in Christianity. He doesn't know any of the truths. He knows that Jesus was, was died, buried, and resurrected and has this blinding experience. And he preaches from his experience. He doesn't preach from what he's heard from somebody else. He preaches from his experience. The best way you're going to share Christ is from your experience. Come on. Somebody, don't go to somebody and say, hey, Pastor Mark said this the other day and I wanted to witness to you and tell you about it because you're, you're going to forget what I said. You've got to say what God's told you in your heart. Come on. Someone say amen. Well, what happens is they get, have a plot to him and he becomes a basket case. They let him down over the... He escapes. They let him down over the wall in a basket and he, he escapes for his life. We know that what happens is as he escapes over the wall of Damascus in a basket, he travels to Arabia from so, for some unknown period of time. It's his desert experience. We don't know how long he's gone there, but he goes to Arabia. Surely he's questioning what's going on in his life. Then he goes to Jerusalem to meet the disciples, but they don't immediately receive him. As a matter of fact, they don't want to receive him. Uh, they understand who he is. They fully understand who he is, and they don't accept him. But, uh, but a Along comes Barnabas, the son of coalition, uh, excuse me, the son of encouragement, and literally takes him by the hand, the Bible says, into his presence in the original. And eventually the commi they commission him, the apostles do, to preach, and he does, until again the Jews rise up to kill him again in Jerusalem. So every place this guy's going, he has opposition. And that opposition is rising up not just to oppose him verbally, they want to kill him. They want to, they want to do something against him. So he, uh, upon which time the disciples, which he's now under their tutelage, uh, under their authority, he puts himself under their authority, uh, how I know that, is because the Bible says they send him away to his hometown of Tarsus. Now, I don't want to be critical and I don't want to be judgmental, but I think the disciples might have had a, a dual reason for doing that. I think they probably didn't know what to do with him either. And so they send them away to Tarsus. Tarsus is extremely far away from Jerusalem. Uh, so they send them all the way to here. So he goes from, he goes down over here from Damascus to Arabia, from, from down to Jerusalem, to Caesarea, which is where they sent him first. And then he goes to Tarsus, and later on he'll go to Antioch. So we see, we see something like this happening. Paul, being a convert, now a believer in Christ, feels he belongs into the community. The community, human as it is, is afraid of Paul because he was their former persecutor. They were not updated on his conversion. It takes Barnabas to assure them that he belongs to them now. The Lord spoke to him and boldly spoke about Jesus. Now Paul goes with the disciples in their preaching ministry. He again speaks boldly about Jesus. Uh, he even debates with the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews. The results of his boldness, they try to kill him. And in verse 30, the brethren help him escape from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritima. It's on the sea coast along the Mediterranean and Tarsus to his hometown. So they sent him away to Tarsus. I told you he spends 10 years there. I'm sure he's questioning, why did they send me away? Why did they not want me there? Why did they defend me? Why didn't they send me to another city? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? How many of you ever questioned, God, what do you want me to do? Any other question? If you haven't questioned that, you probably haven't understood that uh, it's not always clear cut. And it really isn't always clear cut. And so they, he's wondering what he's doing. Ten years, we know he stands there, and he, we have no evidence that he preaches anywhere. He may have, but we have no evidence that he does. He knows that he's being sent to the Gentiles, and he knows it's a tough, that's a tough send. So tonight, we pick up the amazing spiritual drama, and that's what it is, in Acts chapter, 91, chapter 9, verse 31. But before we do, let me peek behind the scenario 
and the scenes of this, of this drama because there's so much going on here that between the lines that we don't hear. And I want to just really kind of tell you what my thoughts were in studying. While the Lord had solved Tarsus on the potter's wheel, remolding his nature into a new man in him, because that's what he was doing for 10 years. If you, are, if you are in a transition period in your ministry, or if you're in a transition period wondering what God wants to do with you, he's putting you on the potter's wheel. He's trying to get everything out of you so he can put everything of him in you. Come on, somebody say amen. So that's what he's doing. He's also, though, God's also, the Lord's also at work in the other, the, uh, the other towering figure of the early church, Simon Barjona. What he did in Simon was to prepare the way for Saul's worldwide ministry. Without Simon understanding this worldwide ministry, it would not have gone. We would have had opposition that would come on very strong. Interestingly, both Peter and Paul were type A personalities. Type A, competitive, time urgent, hostile and aggressive. I like to take out that name hostile and aggressive because I'm actually a type A. How many have figured that out? I'd rather put in there passionate. You get something in your crowd and you're going to go right at it. A type B is relaxed, one thing at a time, and express their feelings kind of not so much. And so we see that type Paul and, and, uh, and uh, Peter are type A personalities. The hardest personality is to change their mind. Listen, I can't tell you how many times Cheryl and I will talk about something and I'll say, well, you know, you said this. And she'll say, oh, well, I really didn't say that. Yeah, you said that. No, I really didn't say that. Yes, you said that. I heard you say that. No, I said this. No, you said And then Cheryl will just kind of get quiet. And I'll just kind of hammer it again and again and again. And so she, I'll say, what's the matter with you? She says, are you done yet? <laughs> Do you not, Cheryl? Look at, look at her shaking her head. She's shaking her head from her toes down to the top of her head. All right. That's right. Here it is. Type A. Highly competitive. They work fast. They have a strong desire to succeed. They like control. And they're prone to suffer stress. They have more heart attacks than type B's, by the way. Type B, non-competitive. Works more slowly. Lacking in desire to succeed. Does not enjoy control of anyone else. Less, or less prone to stress. So think about Peter and think about Paul. They are like to be in control. And so can you imagine P Paul, Saul at this time, 10 years not knowing what he's going to do. 10 years waiting for something. Can you imagine what's going through his mind and imagine Peter. Peter is now the Peter's probably in a spot, and he's spiritual. There's not, there's not. We can't take anything away from Peter's spirituality at this point, but he's he's in command now. It's, it fits his personality type. He's going to be successful. He has a strong desire to succeed, and you're not going to be able to change Peter's mind really quick. How many have ever had met a, a type personality? I won't ask you how many are married to them. I'm ask you how many met them. Put both those hands down, Cheryl, whenever else you're sticking up there saying, I know. <laughs> you can't change their mind many times. It's very hard. And so God has his work cut out because we all have free wills. And so he has his work cut out. So you're still following me today. I want to give you the background. So God has some work to do to temper both of these men and, com and complete transition of the growth of the church beyond the Jews to the Gentiles. It's going to be tough to do. The Lord has given Simon a new name. Years before, he was called Kephas in Aramaic and Petrus in Greek. The name means rock, and you've heard me teach this. And so we know that you are Peter, Kephas. And upon this rock, Kephas, big rock, Aramaic, will I build my church. The adjective this was Jesus. He's pointing to himself. You are Peter. Actually, the literal translation is you're a Peter's small pebble. I am the rock upon this church. It was reflective. I will build my church. So Peter, the man of faith, had to, the stone, the small rock, had to be chiseled out of the rock, Jesus Christ. So he had to go through a chiseling. There, by the way, I grew up Roman Catholic. There may be some Roman Catholics here. I was taught that the church was built on Peter. It was not built on Peter. If the church was built on Peter, that's what would have happened. It's not built on Peter. Matter of fact, Peter was not the first pope uh, Peter was, was, as we know historically, tradition says he was in Rome. There's no historical proof that Peter was ever in Rome. Uh, we know that he was crucified upside down. We understand that. But we don't know that he was in Rome to do that. There's so many sites in Rome to talk to Peter being here and being here. It wasn't. Uh, Peter was the first pope, and I've said this many times, and you've probably heard me say it. I'll say it again. If Peter was the fo first pope, popes cannot marry. Peter had a mother-in-law. You know what I say about that. It's unfair to have a mother-in-law if you're not married. <laughs> So he's not married. So what they did is they did papal succession. From 325 AD, when Constantine became the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, 
and took on the title of Pontifus Maximus. Uh, he became a Christian through the Milton Bridge dream, where he saw a sign above him that said, In hoc signe vinces, in this sign conquer. He went out and defeated Maximilian, who was, who was uh, three times, uh, five times more strong in, in numbers than him. He immediately became a Christian, sent his mother to the Holy Land to dedicate some sites. Uh, she, she dedicated three spots that we will see in the Holy Land, the oldest churches in the world from 330. 3 AD, Church Holy Sepulchre, Church of the Ascension, and the Church of the Nativity. They're still there. And uh, then he made a national religion, and he took all of the bishops of Rome, because Christianity had spread at this time, they were being persecuted. He took all of the bishops of Rome before him and called them Pontifus Maximuses and brought them all the way down to Peter, papal succession, saying Peter was the first pope, and he was, which would have been in the first century, 250 years earlier. So he was not, never called himself a pope. So it's built on Jesus, we know that. So Peter has to be chiseled. He's got to be able to be chiseled out of the rock. And the truth be known, so do you. So do I. And you know, one of the reasons why God put, how many of you ever have some difficult people that you work with or are around or are in your family? Here's what I say. Here's, my, here's what I say. If you don't, or if you don't know and don't get, are not able to handle them, God will send 10 more just like them. Because he's chiseling you. He's chiseling us. We meet people for a reason. You think that God didn't know we were going to meet those people? Uh, I know you liked that one, didn't you? you, think you but that's the truth, is it not? Why are they in your life? There's 8 billion people on the planet. Why were they in your life? Why are you related to them? Because you're being chiseled. You're being shaped in, in, in the image of Christ. That's what we are. How do we get shaped? We get shaped by other people around us and by events and by circumstances. So Peter's going to be shaped. He has to be shaped. Now, we know that... that uh, in so doing, Peter would be one of the foundational stones of the church. And so we'll talk about this analogy of stones. Ephesians, Paul says this, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners with the saints, uh, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And listen to what it says about us. It talks about the Ephesians and us. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So you have to fit the building. So God has to, has to chisel you, just like he had to chisel Peter, because we're built. We're the next foundation. Our grandchildren are coming after us. Our children are coming after us. And so we're the next foundation. Peter was one of the foundation stones. How many are still with me tonight? So uh, Peter had to be molded. Uh, by the way, it's why Peter's name is in the foundation of the New Jerusalem, by the way. And you will see it. In the New Jerusalem, the wall had, uh, the city has 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The New Jerusalem is a testimony of the building that God is doing right now. You are going to eventually live in the New Jerusalem. You're going to have a level on the New Jerusalem. And that New Jerusalem, all you have to do is look down over that wall, and you will see the foundation stones, and they have the names of the apostles on, that found, on those foundation stones. You can see them up there if you look real close. First one is Peter. It's right there. Foundation stones. Those foundation stones are made out of crystal. It would surprise you, and I don't have enough time to give you this tonight, but it would surprise you that those 12 stones are the same stones that are in the priest's ephod. And so those stones are all given to one different, different, uh, different uh, apostle. We know that Peter, is, Simon Peter, is a chrysolite. And so we know that that's a crystal base. So if you get to the New Jerusalem, when you get there, you will see the crystal base. You'll see Peter's name on it. Simon Peter, that is, he's a foundation stone in this great building. Man, I'm getting excited. In this great building called the church. You and I are on the next level. We are the next ones carrying the church. God is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and you are part of that church. But Peter has to be molded. He has to be split open. He needed an earthquake experience spiritually to change his preconceived notions of where the young church was heading. And he was too much of a, of a trained Jew, an A-type trained Jew. And let me tell you something. I've talked to a lot of Jewish friends that I have and then let me tell you, when I can tell them about Jesus, whew, it's like hitting a wall. They will stone you. I'm telling you, they will be so aggressive, it's not even funny. So Peter is a trained Jew. He's not a trained Christian. He's trained in the Jewish religion, steeped in it. All the ceremonies, all the traditions, all the, all the, all the uh, trappings, and all, of the, all the ensembles of it. How many of you are getting what I'm saying? So something has to happen to him. Boy, I read Acts chapter 9, verse 31 to 1130, which talks about Peter, a whole different way than I've ever read it before, because I'm seeing what, what Luke is telling us, as I will show you. How many are a little interested in this? Six of us are interested. <laughs> I lose you now, we're gone. All right, here you go. So, he needed an earthquake experience spiritually, Peter did. 
uh, uh, to change his preconceived notions of where the young church was heading. It's no doubt that Peter loved God. It's no doubt that he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. But he was still a human being, and he had certain traditions and things that he put his hat on that he, he thought were right. And somewhere down the line, he's, nobody said, you can't do this, or you can't do that. He had to come to that realization. Otherwise, he would never have spread or allowed the spread of this religion, ever. Of this, of this way. So Acts 9 to 31, 9, 31 to 11, 30 records that earthquake. It records that experience that cuts through Peter's exterior and opens him up to what the Lord is about to do worldwide. Now, I'm telling you all this in a preface because if you read it by yourself, you're not going to get this. God is doing something. These are not isolated incidences that he just throws in there. These are purposeful. Everything God's doing, the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Every place Peter's going to go from Acts chapter 9 is specifically ordered by the Lord. He's doing something to get him to a spot to change him radically. How many are getting this? So this passage introduces us to a, com a completely new and different kind of guidance initiated by the Holy, in, in Acts by the Holy Spirit in the young church. And specifically, the very Jewish Peter. I want you to think of Peter as Jewish. He is not, we, we would think, as a, as a 21st century Christian. He's Jewish. He goes to the temple. He doesn't go to church. He goes to the temple. He still celebrates the Seder. He, he is very, very Jewish. He still has a tallit. He is not, nobody told him not to do that. This is the way to God. He still observes the Ten Commandments. He's infilled by the Holy Spirit. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God, but it's the Son of a Jewish God. How many are getting with He doesn't know Jesus is the name Jesus. He knows him as, as Yeshua. Peter's name is, is Simon Barjona. So he knows that this is a Jewish thing. I want you to really get that, because sometimes we don't. We Christianize the disciples, and they are Christians, there's no doubt about it, but they were Christian Jews. Okay, we need to understand that. We need to get it really right. So what? A dramatic paradigm shift is about to take place, and Peter needs to be the catalyst to that shift. Things had to change. Christianity was never intended to be another Jewish sect. It was never intended just to be for the Jews, ever. It was to the Jew first, but it was never intended just to be for Jews. It had to expand. Old molds had to be shattered. Walls of separation between people had to come down. The church had to be led beyond the exclusivity of religion to an inclusive exclusivity, an inclusiveness of all races and all national backgrounds. The church had to embrace everyone, or it never would have been the church. How many are with me? And so far, they were not. They were just Jews that were doing it. And a major move away from prejudice and judgment had to occur. Legalist, uh, legalities, for legality's sake, had to be abolished. Religious trappings had to be eliminated. And the Lord was way ahead of the curve. Now all he had to do was change a dyed-in-the-wool A-type personality named Peter into accepting such, this, such a radical change. With a full, with, with a free will through, this would be no easy task. This part of Acts deals with how God did it. The church was about to go global. Change had to come. And it didn't happen all at once or without any resistance or division, as we will see. The church was never intended to be an organization. It was intended to be an organism. An organization has four corners, and that's all where it goes. It has all the rules. An organism, if you put an organism on that platform, it's going to spread everywhere. It's going to go all kinds of places. So it had to take over new territory, new people, new challenges. Jesus didn't come just to establish a new branch of Judaism or a new religion or even just to renew Israel. He came to save the entire world. Every single last person that has ever been born on planet Earth. He came for the Jew. He came for the Gentile. He came for the pagan. He came for the Roman. He came for the Greek. He came for the agnostic. He came for the atheist. He came for the skeptic. He came for the animist. He came for the pantheist. He came for the tribalist. And even today, if you're, if you're watching from video in, on the YouTube, which we're getting a tremendous amount of hits on, these, on these, uh, these studies on YouTube, if you're watching, and you may be a Buddhist, we know that there's Buddhists watching. We know that there's people from Islam. He came for Buddhists. He came for Muslims. He came for Shintoists. He came for Confucianists. He came for New Agers. He came for Globalists. He came came for anarchists. He came for every single person on the planet. The fears for those early Jewish Christians of breaking with the past was equaled only by the danger of starting a new religion. Christianity was and is a movement made of Christ-centered, spirit-filled, transformed, and transforming people. And to show the way, the Lord had to begin with Peter the Rock. So, that's my intro. Here's what he said. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. John 3, 17. 
He's not the judge. I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble with a couple of people here, and that's okay. I, I could take it. I've told you before, I am against capital punishment. I'm probably one of the only pastors I know against capital punishment because it doesn't fit in my Christianity. You can, you can favor it. That's up to you. It's okay. I'm against it. I'm against suicide. I would never, somebody said to me, will somebody go to hell if they, get su if they commit suicide? I said, no, but I'll tell you what. I don't know if they'll go to hell or heaven. I know I would go to hell because I know I'm, I'm given much and much is required of me. I'm against taking signs up and telling homosexuals are going to go to hell. I'm against it. I'm against going and telling somebody that they're going to hell. That's not our, our job. Our job is to tell people you can go to heaven. That's our job. It's totally opposite. We've missed it. And so I want you to understand Jesus came for everyone. We are not judges. We're never supposed to sit on the judgment seat. We are supposed to deal with truth and we're supposed to deal with mercy. Come on, somebody say amen. All right. So just follow me a little bit so I can explain it as we go along. So as we go on, listen to it. And to show the way, the Lord had to begin with Peter the rock. The spiritual earthquake will begin in him and through him. He would be at the epicenter of the force that created the, the chasm dividing the past from the future. Because Peter was prejudiced. Big time. Even though he was filled with the Holy Spirit, there were certain people he would not be around. He was prejudiced. So here's the backdrop to the, to the epic story about to unfold. While Saul spent those ten years in Tarsus praying and waiting, Peter would be used to open the way for ministry to the world, to the Gentiles. God had it covered from the beginning to the end. He always does. He did for the early church and Peter, and he does for you and for me. Let me tell you something. He was the rock. He was going to change him. Let me give it to you. God has you covered. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promise are your armor and your protection. Psalm 91, 4. Our future is in the hands of the all-knowing God. And so he knows what we're doing. He knows what's going on in our lives. But for Peter, as we will see, and for you and for me, it will take faith. It always takes faith. Faith, it does not make things easy. It makes them possible. Because the Bible says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. How many are still with me tonight? Okay, with all that said, I don't have much time. Let's see what happens. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Can you believe I'm just getting into the study? Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. That's kind of interesting because we read in the Acts, beginning in Acts that the church was being persecuted. They were being killed. They were being hunted down. Now they have peace. What's going on here? Look, there are times when our ineffectiveness, we cry, in our ineffectiveness we cry out to God, Lord, nothing is working in our way. You've said it. What do you want me to do? And then there are times when we are able to say the Lord is on the move in our midst. I'm so excited. What will he do next? I'm in that way right now. I am so excited about what God's doing in my life. It's not even funny. I'm getting things coming in the mail. I'm getting things coming through the internet. I'm getting things coming through. Uh, somebody wants to do this. Somebody wants me to be here. I can't go to all the places, but it's an exciting time for me. And there are times in your life where it becomes very exciting. Verse 31 is such a time for the early church. The church had followed the command. They were now in the witnesses in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. So they followed the command. It was obedience. They were obedient, and God always blesses obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That faithfulness of obedience was revealed with peace and amazing multiplication growth. So God gives them a moment of peace, and the church starts to grow exponentially. Exponentially. They were edified, verse 31 says. The word edify is the word okiodemio. You may know it as this, okidoki. That's where we get it from. It's a Greek word. We get the word okidoki from it. I know, you'll learn a lot when you come here. The Greek word okidomio was often translated edification, describes the process of a building, either literally the construction of a physical structure like a house or a temple, or figuratively, the edification upbuilding of God's spiritual house. So this whole thing about building and foundations is all what edify means. It means that God's building the church up. He's edifying them. And that's what this word says. So as he edifies them, he gives them peace and he's starting to build it. As he builds this, he needs a sunny day. He he doesn't need a rainy day. He doesn't need persecution raining down. He's building up the church. There's times in your life where the rain will come and you've got to trust Him. Times where you don't think you're going anywhere and you're building nothing. Then there's those other times when it's a sunny day. And that's the time when God's going to start building you up. Come on, I'm here with me tonight. And you know that something's happening. Man, I love those times. So watch. God was building His church and the people were the raw materials. Let me give you my analogy of it. Uh, the world was the construction site. The Holy Spirit was the master builder. God the Father was the architect who drew up the plans. And Jesus, He was the cornerstone. Laid down 
first on the site, and now the structure is rising into the sky to be a praise and a glory to God. The followers of Christ were being built into his likeness as people in whom he could dwell. Wow, and now the Lord was about to add some construction materials that they would not have included in the original building had it been built in the traditional way. God's about to bring some things on the construction site that, that the, the ones that are in the building are saying, wait, why do we, that's foreign to us. How are you going to use that in this building? I'm mean, getting this. The peace they experienced was preparation for that. So does the Lord change Peter's Jewish point of view? How does he do it? Here in Acts chapter 9, Dr. Luke points us to two healings that the Lord used in Peter's life and used in Peter in. And let me tell you something, they're not coincidence. These are specific. God's doing it because he wants to get Peter into a certain spot. In Acts chapter 9, verse 32, it says this. It says, as Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda. It tells us the city. So Peter's touring the country. He's touring where all the saints are. You can imagine him being in control. And it says, there he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydia and Sharon, that's a plain of Sharon, beautiful spot in Israel, will travel there in a couple of weeks, saw him and turned to the Lord. So he heals Aeneas. Now you may read that and say, oh, that's a great healing. I read that and I study. I read that and I see what's between the lines. And let me tell you what I know about this. Aeneas is a Jewish Greek name. He's a Hellenistic Jew, which means he's not naturally born. He's not like Peter. Peter was an Israeli Jew born in Israel. A Hellenistic Jew was born outside of Israel. I told you about the Hellenistic synagogue. How many remember that? So they were prejudiced against each other, the Jews were. The Jews in Israel, born in Israel, weren't real crazy about the Greek-speaking Hellenistic Jews. This tells me God's done something. He's taken Peter to a spot where there's a Hellenistic Jew. That Hellenistic Jew is, is a believer, but he's still a Hellenistic Jew. He's a believer, and Peter is stepping outside his comfort zone. He's starting to heal somebody that he normally would not bother with. Come on, I'm going to get this tonight. I'm going to get excited if you don't, trust me. So he's bothering me with somebody I wouldn't normally bother with. So Peter must think he's expanding his apostolic acceptance. He must think, man, I'm pretty good. I'm touching people that I would never touch before. I'm going to people that are outside my norm. He is an Israeli Jew, not a, again, he's now a Christian. Aeneas is a, is a Greek Jew, now a Christian. But that doesn't seem to matter a whole lot to the fact that Peter's going outside of his zone. He's going to these people. We don't see him in Jerusalem going to the Hellenistic synagogue, even where Christians are. So something's happening. This is a big step for Peter. Didn't mix together. They didn't mix together. And I'm sure he thinks this is great, or, or is it? But it's nothing compared to what the Lord is about to do with him and to him. Enter the second healing. Second healing comes here. And there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This one was full of good works and alms, alms deeds, which she did. She gave the poor. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. And when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for much as Lydda was close to Joppa. Now why would God tell you that? Because he has Peter and Lydda very close to Joppa. Because God wants him in Joppa. He doesn't necessarily just want him in Lydda. That's just a stepping stone. And the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Now, Peter has a challenge on his hands. First of all, he's, he's going to be going to Joppa, and it's a woman. Now, if you know anything about religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, they do not touch women. Uh, when I go to Israel, I take people to see Zev Berg, my friend. He is a Hasidic Jew that I've been supporting through Mark Rell Ministries. Some of you have helped too. Through Mark Rell Ministries for the last 25 years to take little Jewish kids to Jerusalem from the settlements. And uh, he just called me last week, as a matter of fact, said, very, 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 very backward. Very, he's, a, he's a Z type personality. Called me backwards. He stumbled through his words and he says, I need more money. That's what he said. So uh, I sent him more money. But let me tell you something. He's the only one I know, Hasidic Jew, to allow me to talk about Jesus. Everybody else would stone you. When I take people there, we go down into the feeding center and we go down into the little place where the kids are. How many went there? We go see these kids, just beautiful kids, almost like a Head Start program that we support. And I remember many times I have to tell the women, don't touch him. You know, we're huggy people. So one woman went up to, to, to shake his hand and he went like this. They don't touch women. Peter did not touch women. How many are getting this? And let me tell you what else he didn't touch. Anything that was dead. So God sends the apostles, sends disciples to him and says, we want you to go to, Lydda, to Joppa. There's a woman who has done alms deeds and, we, and he's, going to, he's going to, they want him to heal her. That means he has to touch her, probably. He's probably de debating whether he should or he shouldn't. And he has to go inside of a room where she's dead, which is, makes him 
ceremonially unclean. How many are with me? So, here again is Peter reaching way outside his comfort zone, or so he thinks. He actually touches a woman, and a dead one at that. Two no-nos for a ceremonial pure, pure Jew. So, as we, as we continue on, let me show you how he does it. Then Peter rose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him to the upper chamber, and all the wid widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, put them out, kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand. They want you to know that. Luke wants you to know that he touched her. They gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. This is, listen to me, just listen for a second. The barriers are coming down, and Luke, well, Dr. Luke is an amazing writer. He gives the both names for this woman, Dorcas and Tabitha. Both of them mean gazelle. Uh, Dorcas is her Aramaic name. And then he gives her a Greek name. Why does he do that? Because it's, it's a trifecta. Not only is she a woman that he can't touch, not only is she dead that he can't touch, but she's a Greek Jew that's Christian, which he, wanted, which he just got over that one. I guess he thought, well, I'm already over that one. I might as well do the other two. <laughs> Hellenistic Jew to both, now watch, Greeks and Jews in her good works. So she was also ministering to Greeks and Jews. Peter must have felt himself stretching pretty far. He's not directly ministering to Gentiles, but he's ministering to one who ministered to Gentiles. Peter must have felt that he's come a long way in his, in his maturity, but he has not yet. Not yet anyway. Acts chapter 9, verse 42. So he, he touches her, he lifts her up and presents her alive. Acts 9, 42. Listen, it says, This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. So Joppa is now amazed with everything that's happening. So please note when it took place. Uh, I understand it's in Joppa. Joppa is right here. If you can see it on the seacoast, look over there and look at Lydda. Lydda. Everybody see Lydda? In between Jericho and Joppa. Lydda. So he's in Lydda, comes down from Jerusalem, uh, goes up from Jerusalem to Lydda, and he's in Joppa at the seacoast. Now again, I want you to understand, Bible study is exactly that for me. I study the Bible, and I want you to see what's happening. So let's put it together, so we, we'll see it. So he's, uh, by the way, before we do that, Peter was, in the, was on the move. He's being used by God, and obviously God's bringing him from one spot to another. How many of you believe that God has you right where he wants you? Let me tell you something. He has you right where you want, he wants you. You may not be there forever, but he wants you there right now. There's a reason why you're there. The steps of the righteous are ordered. So Joppa today is a suburb of Tel Aviv. Joppa, if you look at that little minaret over there on the coast... That little minaret will tell you what that means in a moment. Something is by that. This is Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv wasn't built until 1949. It's a new city. It has 2 million people. Joppa has always been there. It's been a little burg of a city. Here's an 1867 drawing of it, I think. 1877 of the marketplace in Joppa. Right on the seacoast. So he has him there. So God has him right where he wants him. Okay, so let's put it together. Joppa in Peter's day was a fishing village. It was on the seacoast. And there was plenty of salt water, seawater. So Peter goes from Lydda to Joppa, from Aeneas to Dorcas, and now Acts chapter 9, verse 43. And this is everywhere that, that Dr. Luke is bringing you. This is why he's told you about those two healings. Let me tell you a couple things. It doesn't tell us about all the other healings that Peter's done. He's been touring Israel. I'm sure there's lots of other healings. All he points out are two of them. Just like it says that if all the, all the works of Jesus were written down in a book, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. God's told you these two, reasons, two healings for a reason. He's showing you, he's bringing him someplace where he wants him. He wants him in a certain spot at a certain time. The timing of God is everything. This is the verse Luke is bringing you to. It says, And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon the Tanner. Now, that this, just listen to it for a second. Don't miss this verse. To Luke's Jewish readers in the first century, it would have made their jaws drop. Just that verse. It would have kept them tuned in to what was coming next. Like an Agatha Christie mystery, they would want to read ahead and see what happened. All because Luke includes the profession of Simon. He says he's a tanner of Joppa. He's a tanner. He tans the hides of animals. Why does Luke tell us that? Well, he actually says it three times in Scripture. Here, in Acts 9.43, in Acts 10.6, and in Acts 10.32. Because he's setting us up for what's about to happen. And he's shocking his readers right before he blows their socks off. This is why. It's the only time in the occupation of Tanner is mentioned in the Bible, the entire Bible. And here's the significance. A Tanner was constantly dealing with dead animals. The occupation was thus regarded with, with aversion by Jews. 
because it necessitated ceremonial contamination, especially in the place of unclean animals. Jewish tanners could not go into the temple to worship. They were unclean. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this. These are unclean, you among that creep. Whoever does touch them when they be dead shall be unclean till the evening. Also, pigs many times were, ta were tanned. They used their skins. And the swine, because it divided the hoof, yet choose not to cut, it's unclean to you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. So, tanners, even Jewish tanners, had to forsake their Judaism in order to touch. And by the way, pigs were one of the most popular things they tanned, according to archaeologists. They were used for coats. They were used for skins. They were used for even drinking water bottles. Jews wouldn't get anywhere near them. But a tanner, to do that, had to forsake his religion. Even though he's a Jew, he has to forsake his religion to do that. Peter ends up staying in this tanner's house. Now, here's an important point. The fact that Peter was willing to dwell with a tanner reveals that he, unlike all other Jews, has taken a giant leap forward and was already altering his views with references to the Old Testament ceremonial laws. He was therefore ready to open up the door to the Gentiles for the gospel. Make note of that for later when we get to it next week because what happens next week is absolutely unbelievable. Acts chapter 10 verse 6 tells us something specifically. That Simon's house was by the seaside. That's what it says. Again, I hope that you're reading scripture the way I've taught you. Why would God, who, why do we care his house is by the seaside? Why would you tell us that? Because, uh, you may, because you may say, so what? Well, by the way, it's still standing today. That's Simon's house. There's the door. We'll visit that. House of Simon the Tanner. It says on top of it in German and English. There it is. Simon the Tanner. Here is it by this. Remember I told you that minaret? It's right next to that minaret on the seashore. Here's a plaque that's on the front of it. You can't read that, but I'll try to get close to do it. Various Christians tell us the story of Simon the Tanner who lived in this house and hosted Peter the Apostle here. It was here that Peter raised Tabitha from the dead and saw his famous vision in which, uh, in which he was commanded to eat animals regarding unclean and Jewish tradition. We'll get to that next one. When he refused, God tells him this is a historic turing, turning point in which Christianity evolved. This is the plaque on the house. This is a, was a historic turning point in which Christianity evolved from what was considered an esoteric sect of Judaism to a worldwide religion. Without this happening, you and I would not be sitting here tonight. Christianity would have been a localized Jewish tradition. That's what it would have been. So just listen to what's going on. So let me give you the accuracy of Scripture. So what? So everything. It's an indication of the accuracy of our text that they say that Simon lived by the seaside. First thing, tanning skins produced a foul smell. Hence, tanning, tanners were not permitted inside the city, but outside the city. This one's outside the city by the sea. Secondly, and there is a factual detail that tanners use sea water, salt, in the process of converting hides into leather. Un Underline seaside in your Bibles in Acts chapter 10, verse 6, and enter it in your margins, the precision of the biblical text and the accuracy of Scripture, all setting Peter up. Peter is in store for the biggest challenge of his Jewish Christian life. Would he be able to minister to a pagan Gentile Roman? Or would he prejudice the gospel on his own prejudices? It's a great question for all of us tonight. Are you prejudiced? Do you think white people are different than black people? Think black people are different than white? There's black white prejudice and there's white black prejudice. And there's not just white prejudice against blacks, there's black prejudice against whites. Listen, are you, are you, are you prejudiced against Muslims? When you do, are you prejudiced against blatant sinners? When you see homosexuals and you see them caught, bl blurring out their cause? I, I don't like it. I think it's really sad. But listen, I'm sent to them. So are you. Amen. They are us. Come on, somebody say amen. Are you prejudiced against the, an atheist? Somebody said to me, no, I have a brother and he's an atheist and I want him to talk to you, but I'm afraid to let him talk to you because he's an atheist. He says, that's who I'm going to talk to. I want to talk to atheists. Bring him around. Listen, how about opponents or enemies or people who cause you grief? They're the ones we're sent to. Here's the problem. They're sinners. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Don't judge me because my sins are different than yours. Our sins are, we're all sinners. Are we able to truly minister to them? How do you feel when, you, when you're around a Muslim? How do you feel when you go to Walmart and you see someone with a burqa or somebody with a, with a veil over them and you know obviously it's a Muslim? How do you feel when, when as I told you when I was at the Navajos, when a, when, a homo, when a lesbian woman sits next to me and asks me a question? How do you feel? What are you going to say to them? Well, are you getting nervous? Or is the, are these the ones that God sent us to? These are the ones God sent us to. As we close tonight, our job is not to judge. Our job is not to figure out if someone deserves something. Our job is to lift the fallen, to restore the broken, and to heal the hurting.
We can judge others or we can love others, but we cannot do both at the same time. It's impossible. I can have peace of mind only when I forgive rather than judge. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let me tell you who does the condemning. If somebody gets saved, it's the Holy Spirit's job to condemn them. He's the one that leads them. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Your job is to figure out a way to show them love wrapped in truth. It's a tough job, but that's what we're called to do. Lastly, let me give you this tonight. Prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming not to judge and condemn us, me, but to heal us, me, to recover us, me, enliven us, me, save us, me, that we may be your new and heavenly citizens for the kingdom of God. Remember the foundations? Lord, we love you as our physician and our shepherd. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Peter is in for the shock of his life. God's setting him up. Don't think that God doesn't set you up. Don't think that God doesn't put people in your life for a reason. Don't think that God doesn't put people who oppose you in your life for a reason. He's trying to get you to the end of yourself so that you trust him. I'm not saying you have to be happy around everybody you're around, but your attitude is, is important, so is mine. There are people in my life that rub me like a cat the wrong way. And let me tell you something, I want to run as far as I can. Sometimes I want to say my mind to them, but I have to think about it. God put them in my life for a reason. I may not want to be around them, I may not have to be around them, but my heart, when I'm away from them, cannot be against them. My heart has to say, God, I want to be able to minister. Put me in a spot that's neutral so that I'm not hurt by them, but that they will come to me when they have a need and I won't close that door. So tonight, I'm going to ask us all to stand for a moment. Prejudice runs deep. It really does run deep. I grew up in an Italian city. In the Italian city, I grew up with the other, the other major group of people, I think I've told you this before, were Polish. And the Polish-Italian jokes were unbelievable against each other. And they hated each other. You know why? Because they were striving for the same jobs in the mines. And so the Italians stuck together and the Polish stuck together. And boy, you couldn't take one against the other. I remember when I told my mother that I was marrying a woman that was Polish. She said to me, can't you find a sweet Italian lady? I said, I don't think I want to, Mom. I found the right one. Let me tell you something. It's because someone's different than us that makes us prejudiced. But that's how God made us. He made us all different. And he made us different so that we could all be one. The greatest miracle of Christianity is making all these different things one. Do you know you're closer to me than some of my relatives who are not saved? Because no matter where you came from or who you are, you have the blood of Jesus flowing through your veins, and so do I. So we're family. But tonight, I'm going to pray a prayer. And this is the prayer I'm going to pray as we close our, our, close our eyes and just drop our heads for a moment. Father, I pray tonight that you open our eyes to the people that are around us. Lord, we know that there are sinners all around us. We are, we are nauseated at some of the sins we see that are so blatant. But we don't want to abandon truth because we know the truth. But also let us know that mercy has to meet truth. We have to have mercy and believe that we can be the answer. We're not somebody that's condoning sin by any means. But Lord, we have to be the answer where else does the answer come from? And so tonight, Lord God, whether it's somebody who's a liberal, pushing a liberal agenda, Lord God, when we go one-on-one -on -one with them, Lord God, let us sit, show the mercy and the compassion of God. Let us realize, Lord, that they are us. They just need you. Lord, I pray tonight, if we see someone who's a Muslim, someone who's gay, Lord God, or homosexual, Lord, and they're, and they're blatant about it, Lord, that we don't snap back at them, but that somehow your Holy Spirit gives us the creative words to be able to reach out to them and to tell them about Jesus. Lord, I pray tonight a blessing on every one of us. I pray, Lord God, that scales will fall from all of our eyes and then let us know that everybody we see in life has a divine appointment. You put them there for a reason. The good, the bad, and the ugly, you put them there for a reason. Let us minister to them, Lord God, so your church can grow, so the foundation can stay strong and full to the next level. Bless us now, Lord. Keep us safe this week. Bring us back next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.